Well, good to be here with you guys. Welcome tonight. Um, as you may, I guess you may not know, all school year we've been going through the book of Ephesians, and we are getting close to the end. And last week we looked at the reality of spiritual warfare. And, you know, Tyler's song there about, you know, I'm going to battle today. And that we are in a spiritual battle. We sometimes stick our heads in the sand. Sometimes we ignore it or uh, dismiss it or excuse it away or make some other thing about it where, where we don't take it seriously. But the reality is that the enemy is real and we need to take him seriously. And we need to take the battle seriously. And so Paul says to be strong in the Lord. That we have to be strong in the Lord that... Uh, he is the one who has the power. We don't have any power in and of ourselves. Uh, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, but you're not. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. And so, so we're talking about last week, you know, the, the reality of spiritual warfare and the battle that we're in and, uh, and, and dressing appropriately and being prepared. And, and when I'm thinking about this and thinking about armor, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was the Avengers. And... I like the Avengers, and they've got some cool stuff. You know, Captain America's got the shield, and uh, of course Iron Man is an entire arsenal in and of himself, and Thor's got his hammer, and, and, and there's some neat stuff. I mean, there's Hulk, and he's just Hulk. But <laughs> as I was thinking about the Avengers and how, you know, they're all cool, and I can see them picking up their weapons and getting ready for battle, and I was like, but you know, they all look different. They're, they don't match at all. And it occurred to me, they're not really a team. They're more like a bunch of solo artists that come together, you know, Earth's mightiest heroes, when Earth really needs them, and when the universe is at stake, and then they go back and do their thing again. You know, Thor goes back and makes his own movies, and Captain America goes and makes his own movies, <laughs> right? And, and they don't look the same because they're not really a team. If they were really a team, they would dress the same, like the Fantastic Four or the X-Men or something like that. Those guys are teams, and they always go to war together. And even in more of a modern, uh, uh, real analogy, thinking about uh, like a sports team or marching band or uh, a military group, whether it's the Army or the Marines or, or firefighters or policemen, they all wear uniforms and they match. Right, Because they're all a part of a team. They're in it together. And so here we are because we are part of a team, because we are in this spiritual battle together. It's not that you've got your armor and, and my armor looks very different, but that we're all trying to appropriate and wear the armor of God. And because we are a team, because we're in this together, we're going to do this differently tonight. And so Reese and Tyler and Andrew and I are, are going to take turns walking through this armor of God. And, and expounding it and, and working through this passage of scripture. And so uh, let me read. I'm going to start in verse 13 just to tag it back to last week. Let me read Ephesians 6, 13 through 17. It says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So I have a, a little bit here to share with you guys about the belt of truth, having the belt of truth fastened on. Now, belts are a useful, interesting thing. Uh, back in this day, of course, the people would wear belts and, and uh, they had these kind of long cloaks and things that they would wear. And when it was time to go, when it was time to get serious, when it was time to get down to work, they'd tuck their, their cloak in to their belt. Uh, Paul here has this picture of a soldier and, and he'd be wearing this belt. And the belt is what holds everything in place. You know, you tie down your belt, you cinch it up another notch and you're ready to go. And, and when he calls it the belt of truth, guys, this is what truth does for us. Truth holds all the other pieces of armor in place. If we allow there to be even a little bit of, of falsehood or deceit or false teaching or lies or wrong thinking, uh, when these things creep into our lives, then the other pieces of armor start to slip out of place. 
And so I just briefly want to give you guys three things about the belt of truth and truth in general, truth specifically, not in general. Uh, first of all, guys, we have to identify the truth. I mean, truth, you know, ooh, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Right? I mean, that's on campus. I don't know if it's on every educational institution in America or not, but generally that means education. That means knowledge. But what is truth? Uh, is it relative? It's very debated in our world today. Where do we find truth? Is truth absolute? Is truth relative? You know, what's true for you is true for you. And what's true for me is true for me, right? And you can have your truth as long as it doesn't infringe upon my truth. But for anybody to say, I have the truth with a capital T, maybe that sounds a little arrogant. Maybe that sounds like, oh, yeah, how, how do you have the corner on truth? And so what is truth? Where does truth come from? Well, uh, when Jesus was in front of Pilate, Jesus said to Pilate, John 18, 37 and 38, Jesus said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate, you know, kind of, I, I think there was a little bit of snarkiness in his voice when he says, what is truth? It's like, really, come on, what is truth? Well, Jesus, just a chapter before, had been praying for his disciples, and he prays for all of us, which is really cool. John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for you. If you are a follower of Christ, he prayed for you. And Jesus says, he's praying to the Father, and he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. God is true, and God's word is true. That's why we sing that song, you know, give me faith to believe, because it is true. God defines truth. Paul often refers to the gospel as the message of truth. And so first we identify truth. What is truth? Truth comes from God. We don't get to pick and choose what's true. We don't decide what's true. We don't define what's true. God is the author of truth. You know, and belts, the truth that holds things together. But belts also, at times, can be a little uncomfortable. Uh, belts are sometimes belts are depressing honestly you put a belt and you're like oh are you serious like i'm not cinching it up another notch i'm going the other way right you're like this belt needs extra holes in it you know <laughs> uh, i'm sorry if you've ever had to experience that i've drilled holes in a belt before it's not fun <laughs> but you know sometimes whether or you know gotten out of shape we, we put on a little weight or we just haven't worn a belt or sometimes you've been wearing one belt and and uh if, I'm not going to because it'd be really socially awkward, but I, I could take off my belt that I'm wearing right now and it doesn't like hang down in a straight line. Like it's conformed in a certain way because it fits me. And if you put it on, you'd be like, that's, that's not very comfortable. If I got a new belt, it wouldn't fit quite as well. It would, it would make me feel pinched a little bit. And guys, truth is kind of like that. Like truth can be uncomfortable. But as we identify truth and we recognize the truth, we have to own the truth even when it pinches us even we're like oh man i don't know if i like that in fact there's a lot of hard truth in god's word and uh, jesus tells his disciples at one point he says i tell you the truth guys in john 16 he says i tell you the truth he's he's done that he's getting ready to leave and they're like whoa whoa, 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 whoa. jesus don't leave and he says no i'm telling you the truth it is good for you that i go away and there i mean that like if Jesus was here and he's like, I'll see you guys later. I'm not coming back for a long time, but you know, I'll be back someday, but, but I'm leaving right now, but don't worry. It's going to be all good. This is what's best for you. We'd just be like, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I'm like, how many of us is going to take to keep Jesus here? We're going to pile on him, right? <laughs> but Jesus, I'm telling you the truth. This might be hard for you to believe. It might be hard for you to understand, but it's true. And so are we going to accept those times when the word of God is hard and it's uncomfortable, but it's true. There's definitely been some truths of God's word that I've encountered that were hard and uncomfortable. And as I've worn them, I've gotten used to them and I love them. But I continue to meet new things in God's word. I'm like, oh, well, that's uncomfortable. Are we going to accept it or not? Are you going to wear the belt or not? Are we going to own the word of truth? We have to identify the, the word of truth. We have to own the word of truth. And guys, we have to live it. Um, I've never seen a pair of sweatpants that has belt loops. 
You know, you put on your sweatpants when you're like, I'm just going to chill today, right? I'm taking it easy. I'm going to relax. I don't, you don't need a belt because you're not planning to do anything. <laughs> but you put a belt on because you got work to do, because you got things that are important that need to be taken care of. And the word of truth, guys, the belt of truth isn't just I acknowledge that God is the source of truth and I even agree with the truth of what God says, but then I live my life according to the truth. This is how I put on and appropriate the belt of truth in my life, that I have to live it out. I love in Galatians chapter 2 where Paul calls Peter out in front of the whole church and he says, you know, he says, I had to call him out because he wasn't living in line with with the truth that the truth makes demands on our lives are we going to wear it or not are we going to live according to the truth or not the truth is what holds all of these other pieces in place i know tuesday morning i had one of the worst mornings i've had in a very long time as long as i can remember it was miserable i was so discouraged i was so down And God gave me Isaiah 40. And the truth of Isaiah 40, and you can read it later, of who God is and what He does and how glorious He is, that was what picked me up. That was what changed the course of how I was doing in my day. And, and really, it's been phenomenal. It's the word of truth. It's the belt of truth. It holds all these other pieces in place. But we have to, we have to rightly identify it, guys. And we got to own it. Like, no matter how hard it is, no matter how uncomfortable, if it pinches. And finally, guys, we live it out in our daily lives. The word of truth, the belt that holds all the other pieces in place. And as we look at this truth, we, under, we start to see that God's word is absolutely true. When it says in verse 14, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, it continues. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Three things that we must stand in. The first one being God's truth. That it holds all things together. That after everything is equipped, after everything is put on, it holds it fastly. And as you learn how to wear it, you learn that it grows more comfortable as you do. And you start to understand it. And you start to understand that these things that are here in Ephesians 6 are true. And that's where we're going to go. We're going to go straight into our next piece of equipment, our next piece of armor. And that is the breastplate of righteousness. It says to put it on. In the NIV it says, make sure it is in place. You need to understand what this means. You need to understand that when it's in place, it fits well. And it does its job. When it's in place, it protects everything it is intended to protect. And this is the best place. You must understand what this means. And it means this. It's true that Christ's righteousness covers every Christian. But I don't believe all of you understand that or believe that. This is why it's so important. The Bible says, clothe yourself with Christ. And Ephesians says, put on Christ. Put Him on. He is your armor. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake God made Him to be sin who knew no sin so that in Him in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's good news. But you don't understand that. And i tell you why. Because if you did, you'd understand that I can walk new because it's true. Right? The belt of truth holds this back together that His righteousness alone makes us right with God. I want to give you an example. Look at David when he comes to King Saul and says, like, I'm going to take down Goliath. Just, just give me a chance. Just give, just give me a chance. And what's Saul do? Well, you're kind of small. Here, wear my armor. What happened? It didn't fit. It didn't fit. Why didn't it fit? It wasn't made for him. What was it? It wasn't, it wasn't God's armor. It was man's armor. It was a man telling him, you need to wear this because this is what is going to help you. That's what he was saying. 
Not only did it didn't fit, if it didn't fit, it doesn't protect, right? If it doesn't fit, it doesn't protect. It was man's armor. And what's he do? He throws it off. He's like, I don't want man's righteousness. I don't want my own. My own one, save me. But God's will. And he took it straight down to the battlefield. And he killed Goliath. And in God's own righteousness, in his own power, he killed the giant. And when you go to battle, you're going to battle every day against an enemy who wants to kill you. And if you start putting on your own good works, you start putting on your own strength, you start putting on your own power, you're going to fail because you don't understand the strength of our enemy. Again, you don't understand his righteousness. So we're going to get there. It's going to be beautiful. Understanding that God's righteousness that has been given to us protects us from three things. One, the wrath of God. The wrath of God. You have no righteousness. If you've ever read your Bible at any length, you're going to find man isn't good. You're not good. I have done all these things and I really am a bad person. If you are a Christian. Many people believe that, hey, you know, I'm a good person. I do this. I do that. I can get to heaven on my own good works. You know, I give to charity. I do this. I do that. I was talking to a guy named John today. That's how he was getting to heaven. It was sad. It protects us from the wrath of God. Why? Because on the cross, Christ bore your sin. He took your sin, and in his perfect life, what's he do? He gives you his righteousness. And you clothe it, and you wear it, and it's armor, and you, you, you love it because why? It's true. It's true. And you're looking at it, and you say, oh, I'm, I'm saved. I'm, I'm free from the penalty of sin because His perfect life, His perfect life of fulfilling the law on my behalf covers me and I wear it proudly because it's the only thing that's going to save me on that day. And it protects you from your own flesh. His righteousness protects you from your own flesh. How so? Romans 6, 18. Now that you are free from sin, you're now slaves to righteousness. You have now been set free in Christ and that you're wearing His righteousness. You are no longer under sin. By His grace, you are now free to practice righteousness, free to love righteousness, free to set you free from the bondage of sin. Praise the Lord. Now, the last thing, the accuser. He, his righteousness protects you from the devil, the father of lies, the accuser. You just look at Zechariah chapter 3. Here is Joshua, the high priest, and he's standing next to the devil. And the devil said, he is accusing him. The devil is accusing him. But the Lord says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. He is a firebrand snatched from the fire. And what else does he say? He says this. He says... And this is the description of Joshua, that he's covered in filthy rags. And the devil's over. He's like, he's not worth it. He is sinful. God, you punish me? You punish me for eternity? And he, you're not punishing him? Why not? Why? Because God says, I am going to cover him with clean, holy linens. I'm going to cover him in my own righteousness. And that's why he can stand. And that's just the gospel. That's the gospel. And this is the best part. Because since that is true, we understand that we are standing firm, tightened up with our truth and understand that the righteousness of Christ covers us. And we, we go out and we're ready and we're standing firm and our feet are firmly planted in our shoes. We're laced up and we're ready to go. Understanding that this gospel, this fact that Christ... God became flesh and He bore sin. He lived a perfect life and He took your sin on the cross. And He says, Come to Me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. He, he says, I will give you My perfect life. You can have perfect standing before God for nothing at all. And it's all by His grace that He does this. And when you see that, you stand in that. It's like, 
I have nothing but the righteousness of Christ. I have nothing but His strength. I am nothing without His righteousness. And we understand finally that in His righteousness, in His righteousness alone, are we perfect in the sight of God. We are justified. It is as if just as we have never sinned, that we are cleansed, we are perfected in Christ, and that He gives that to you freely. And this is where we always need to stand. And we stand firm in these things, understanding that the righteousness that covers us, it really saves us. It really makes us righteous. It's true. And with this gospel, you walk and you stand firm in it and you believe it and you preach it to yourself every day because you need to because you're going to fail every day. And when you fail, you're going to say, God, I suck. And, you're, and he's like, no, I love you because Jesus Christ covers you. That's right. And you believe that because it's true, because his word's true. <laughs> Well, we've talked about the belt, right? The belt of truth that holds it all together. It's what keeps us fastened and tight. Talking about the breastplate and our feet. Being able to, at the beginning of this, stand firm. Standing firm in the gospel. So what we're going to cover now, the shield and the helmet. Ephesians, we're going to read from 16. Follow along. 16. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation. You notice that? In all circumstances, every situation, take up the shield of faith. So, when you think about a shield, maybe you've seen, I'm sure you have, you've seen movies, they've got like, whether it's wooden uh, shield or it's got some metal around the edge or maybe it's a metal shield and there's guys plucking their arrows and what happens? Tink, 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 sticks right in there, right? Okay, now imagine if that's on fire. Stabs right into your wooden shield. What's going to happen? Your shield's going to catch on fire. All right? So what are you going to do with your shield? You're going to try to put it out. Oh, it's not. It's getting worse. You're going to throw it in your shield. <laughs> right? Your shield is going down on the ground. You are no longer protected in all circumstances. But we don't have a shield like that. We have a shield that it says here that we can extinguish all the flaming darts of the e evil one. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us what faith is. It says it is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen. And in Proverbs 30, verse 5, well, throughout the whole uh, Old Testament, we have more of an image of what the shield in reference to God is. And I think this is really good here. It's Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. He is a shield. He is our shield. You see that? He can, he can extinguish those flames. Okay? Romans 15.3 says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those uh, the, insults, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. The insults of, my, of me have fallen on him. He's taken, he's taken it all. God takes those flaming fiery darts and he extinguishes them. You see that? He is our shield. There's a great example of this in Luke 4. You're familiar with the temptation of Jesus, right? When he's taken out to the desert and Satan tempts him. And he asks him these three questions. Do you remember what they are? One of them is, hey, why don't you, you're the son of God. How about you turn this, uh, this, this stone into bread, right? What's his other question? He's like, hey, here's all these kingdoms. Here's all the glory. Here's all the authority. I'll give it to you. Just bow down and worship me. And he also asked him, Hey, uh, you're the son of God. 
you, you're, you've got eternal life. He does, that's me quoting that. Why don't you just jump down from here? Uh, and the angels are going to catch you. You're going to survive. There's three temptations that he's faced with. Now, how is this? Okay, so where's the shield come in here? Where does this come in? I'm believing, I'm hoping, and trusting in God. The hope of things that are going to, to come. The assurance of things hoped for. Jesus sees this provision that God is going to take care of. He's tempted by Satan saying, here, command the stone. But he's believing God in his provision. He's trusting in the provision of God, having faith, trusting in God. There's the provision of him being answered. And he answers uh, with, with uh, God will, um, meeting our needs. He says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Remember this? This comes from Joshua. We reference it later in Hebrews, but it's coming from Joshua. Jesus is believing this word. That God is not going to leave him nor forsake him. He is going to take care of his needs. The authority and glory that he's tempted with, well, uh, he's going to have that anyway, right? He's trusting, knowing that God is going to give me all authority and glory over everything. He has dominion over all things. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he will repay each person according to what he has done. God has already promised him that he will have authority over all. Satan is tempting him with something that God is already going to give him in all three situations. The last one, he's saying, here, why don't you just throw yourself down? Death doesn't have any, have any hold on you. Why don't you just throw yourself down? And Jesus would ultimately conquer death, trusting in God, that, faith, that shield of God, that shield of faith that extinguishes those fiery darts. Now, you could take from this also that there is, uh, there's more of an uh, offensive strike here instead of just defense. But we're going to leave that to Andrew to talk about. He's going to talk about the sword. We're going to move on to the helmet of salvation. But before that, I want to read this. This is Psalm 18, verse 2. It says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. So what's a helmet do? Protects your head. Yeah. Keeps you safe. You ride a motorcycle, what do you do? You put on a helmet. You play football, what do you do? You put on a helmet. You play rugby, you get head injuries. <laughs> right? So you put on a helmet. It protects us. It keeps us. This is, where, this is where we get the direction for our limbs, for our body. Remember, we talked about this whenever I was preaching. We were talking about headship, giving the, the demonstration about our head and our limbs. And this is what's controlling this right here. And you're smiling, and it's all happening in here. We keep this protected. And in a spiritual sense, we're talking about the battle for your mind, the protection of your mind. Paul references... The helmet of salvation. I don't think this is just him making up this great idea about, oh, you know, this would be a great analogy. I'll bring up all this armor stuff, and it'll be cool. This is Isaiah 59, verse 17. He put on, remember that? We're talking about putting on. He put on righteousness as a breastplate. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it, Reese? Yes, it does. And a helmet of salvation on his head. Paul also references this again. In First Thessalonians 5, 8, saying, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for the helmet of the hope of salvation. There is something that is supposed to happen when we have this helmet of salvation that is supposed to have a calming effect. For when you go into battle, if you're nervous, what's going to happen? You're probably not going to do that well. So if you can imagine whatever sport you can think of, if you've done it, or maybe you're, uh, you're doing some public speaking or performing somewhere, and you have all these nerves and these thoughts little, little, little going on in your head, what happens? You get all cotton mouth, you dry up, you start, your palms get all sweaty, and you don't perform well, right? That's what happens. In your mind, when you have calmness and there's peace, and one thing in particular that I really want to point out is joy. When there is joy, 
That is what grants peace. That is what will grant calmness. Because we have joy from the salvation that is given to us from Christ. He gives us that righteousness as a breastplate. His, his truth is carried with us, holding everything together. Our feet are, are, are firm from the gospel, standing in it. We have the shield of God, this helmet. Psalm 140, verse 7 says, O Lord, my Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. I can go confidently with joy. This is Psalm 20, verse 5 says, May we shout for joy over our salvation in the name of our God and set up banners in his name. This is tying this together and leading this into what Andrew is going to be talking about. The psalmist writes again, saying, My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. This joy that we get from resting in his salvation, going into battle, is where we will be able to have that mind that is clear, it's focused, it's ready for battle. Because even if I have this, this on, and I've got this on, and my feet are planted, but my mind is not trusting in those things, I'm not really receiving that joy, I'm not ready for battle. And that's why I have to put on the whole armor of God. And we get this armory, it's, there's an armory that we get all this, all this from. And I'm going to let Andrew describe what that is. Well, let me just say this. Um, armor is great for battle. But if I'm going into battle, I want more than just armor. So I would like a sword. <laughs> you see, um, a sword, there's a lot of power in a sword. Um, well... I could take your life right now if I really wanted to with the power that I have in my hand, but I'm not going to. Hey, bottom line is this. Hannah, I want you to come up here. Okay. I want you to observe a few things about this sword. It's the size of me? It's the size of you. That's a good observation. I want you to, uh, I don't know, move it around or just feel it. How does it feel? Heavy. Heavy. I'm not going to let you swing it right here. Um, that might get messy. But you, you've established that it's heavy, and would you maybe say that it's awkward? Yeah. Okay. You see, as a, a kid, I loved swords because we think of swords. Thanks, that's all I need. Okay, good. We, I just wanted someone small to tell me that this was powerful and heavy and weighty. As a kid, I loved swords. I told you guys that at the girls' night, by the way. That wasn't planned, but... I loved swords because, you know, I saw all my heroes on TV as a kid sitting here wielding these swords um, well, like heroes do. And so I collected them, and I had my grandpa build me swords in his little wood workshop, so I had wooden swords, and I'd run around slaying imaginary dragons or whatever in hopes that you know one day I could wield a real sword and in doing so I got to understand you know this this isn't as easy as it looks um, and in fact it's so difficult to wield a sword effectively that okay so I'm a history buff in some ancient cultures um, to make them better warriors these, these clans, these tribes, these, these societies, whatever they were, they would give their troops swords in their training and everything that they had to do was done with a sword in their hand. It didn't matter if they were eating, it didn't matter if they were sleeping, it didn't matter if they were running 10 miles. It was done with a sword in their hand. And the reason for that was so that they would understand 100% at all times what it meant to have that sword in hand. Because if you don't know how to use it, it's awkward and it slows you down and it's weighty. They did this in hopes that it would become part of you, that it would become like another appendage to you so that you could wield it effectively. 
and in understanding how to wield it effectively, they made themselves more effective to their cause as warriors. Okay, so here we are, and we're talking about, you know, we've talked about the, the belt, the, the breastplate, the helmet, you know, our armor, our shield. The sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? It is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It is a spoken word. This is our sword, okay? The spoken revealed Word of God is our sword. It is our weapon. It is what we do battle with. How well do you brandish and wield your sword? Do you know it? Okay, I know that we can sit here and for days, you know, we can talk. Yeah, for days. We can, sit here, we can sit here and we can talk to you guys about, hey, you got to have a quiet time. You know, you got to pray. You got to do all these things. You know, you got to be disciplined. But are you? Do you know how to use your sword? Is it part of you? Does it live in you? Does it slow you down? Is it awkward? Is it restrictive? Or do you know how to use it to its full effectiveness in battle? This isn't something to be taken lightly. Why? Because we do not wage war against flesh and bone. No. A sword is a close quarters combat weapon because Satan fights dirty. He's up in your face. It's nasty and it's personal. So we have to have something that we can fight him off in close combat with. Because like Reese said, he wants to take you down. And he wants to kill you. In order to understand how to use this sword, we have to invest in it. We have to be in it daily. We have to let it drive us. It has to be our daily bread. It has to be everything to us. It has to be our defense, it has to be our shield, it has to be our helmet, it has to be everything to us. You know, a sword is not just offensive, but it's defensive. It has to be everything. It can't, we cannot, okay, a sword in its state, it, okay, this sword, it's here. The sword isn't restrictive, okay? The sword is here and it's established. And it was established to do one thing. It's me that makes it restrictive if I don't understand it. And it's you that makes this restrictive if you don't understand it. We have to understand it. And the only way to understand how to effectively use this sword, I'm just going to drop it. The only, sorry Phil, the only, it's his sword. The only way, the only way to effectively understand how to use this sword and what it's meant for is to be yielded to who owns the sword? The spirit owns the sword. These cultures that would give their warrior swords and make them do everything with it, they had trainers. The swords belong to the government. Our sword belongs to our government, to our God, to our be-all and end-all. And to understand how to yield it, to understand how to wield it, we have to yield to the one who gives it to us, the Spirit. It's the sword of the Spirit, and He needs to teach us how to use it. 1 Corinthians uh, 2, 12, uh, 12 through 13. Now we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. We can't... It's like Jason said, we can't make the Bible say what we want it to say. It says what it says, okay? It is established. It is established. It's us that restricts it when we put our own spiel on it just because something doesn't make us comfortable, you know? And, you know, preaching is full of folly. We are humans full of human error up here trying to... Our, our best to give you an understanding and an interpretation that the Spirit has given us. But even in that, we are sinful creatures who fail. And you, you have to let the Spirit lead you 
at all times. Because I'm, I'm not going to lie. There's times when I get up here and not on purpose, but I know I'm not giving you truth all the time because I'm a sinful man. You have to let the Spirit guide you and teach you how to wield this sword. Because if you don't, you're restricted by yourselves. You have to let the Spirit teach you how to wield. If we allow the Spirit to teach us, if we allow it to show us how to use it, we become empowered. If we submit to the Spirit and teach Him, let Him teach us how to use this word, this sword, we become empowered by the word. If you don't believe me, okay, I'm just warning you, it's time for me to brag on my God. Okay? I'm going to brag on my God. So, okay, if you don't believe that there is power just in the Word of God, the revealed, the spoken Word of God, listen to this, you know. How was the world created? How was the universe created? How were stars created? By a God who breathed them, who spoke them into existence. He spoke the world and creation into existence. Just by the utterance of phrases like that, it's done. The Word of God is living and it conquers all because the Word of God is truth. Amen. The Word of God is our righteousness. Amen. The Word of God is our faith. The Word of God is our salvation. It's our defense. It's our refuge. And nothing can stand against the Word of God. You know, this wasn't planned tonight to sing He Reigns, but... You know, it's God's favorite song, so why not sing it? That, okay, that was me not speaking biblical truth, but I'd have to imagine that that's probably his favorite song. Um, okay, but for real though, I'm, my favorite line, and a lot of you know this in that song, says the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word, you know? All the powers of darkness tremble at what they've just heard because all the powers of darkness can't drown out one single word, one single spoken word. Jesus reigns. And at the name of Jesus, the very spoken word of His name, every knee would bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth that Christ reigns supreme. And just at the sound of Jesus' name, just at His spoken word, the demons shudder and hide. Ooh, there's power in the name. With His spoken word, He brings judgment. With the spoken word from His mouth, He brings eternity. Listen to what Revelation 19 has to say. And then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, is called Faithful and True. And his righteousness, in his righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Hey, there's our salvation reference. And the name by which he is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of god the almighty on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written king of kings and lord of lords it goes on to say and then i saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead Come gather for the great supper of God to eat flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the sight, had done signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast." And those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And listen to this. And the rest were slain by the sword, the very spoken word of God that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. How awesome is it? That our God, 
our Savior, who like a, a lamb silently went to the slaughter, comes back as a conquering king. And he conquers by his very spoken word. The, word. the very word of God, the very name of Jesus is what will extinguish evil once and for all because nothing can stand against it. Not even the gates of hell can stop it because the word of our Lord, the revealed spoken sword word of our Lord is what endures forever. Another uh, song that I love and we'll wrap it up with this. I'm going to pray and then Tyler's going to come up and sing for us one more song. The mountains shake before him and the demons run and flee just at the mention of the name King of Majesty. There is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power, presence, or the living word of the great I am. Mm. Let's pray, guys.